Hey guys, today we are in Luke chapter 12. So if you remember Friday, we left off on 11 with talking about uh, the woes, all the woes to the Pharisees. Well, he continues that idea in 12 and he says, beware the leaven of the Pharisees. Beware the leaven. Think about leaven. Leaven is yeast, right? Um, and we've talked about it several times, but it's just a little bit um, that that spreads throughout um, a batch. Not only does it spread throughout a batch of dough, but it also swells. It causes it to rise, right? So what is this um, leaven, right? We see in verse one, it says, um, it is hypocrisy. And so these Pharisees are acting like they're the best. They're acting like they're religious. They're acting like they are right, but it is wrong. And so Jesus just gave the woes of the Pharisees. And then he turns to the crowd and he says, now you guys got to be careful because the leaven of the Pharisees, their hypocrisy is going to spread, right? It's going to spread throughout everybody. So be careful. Um, hypocrisy only lasts with concealment. There's a level of where the Pharisees would meet and be private and say, okay, we can do this, we can do that, we can't do that, we can do this, and we're gonna make these people do this and do that and do that. There was a, there's, there's a concealment there, right? And that's why Jesus goes in in verses in three and four and basically says everything's gonna be brought to light. There's nobody's, there's not gonna be any hiding in the end times, right? There's not gonna be, um, anything that's secret, all things will be brought out. And so that hypocrisy of the Pharisees is going to be brought to light. So be careful, Christians, um, to not be like them, which makes sense coming off of all those woes of chapter 11. And then he goes on uh, in verse four, and he says, uh, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body. Remember, Jesus knows that all the disciples are going to be martyrs. All the disciples are going to die for Jesus except for one, for John. He And he just lives a, a super old life, right? Uh, and so uh, he knows that. And he's saying, hey, don't, don't fear, right? The body is here. Don't fear that. But I warn you uh, to whom you fear, you need to fear him who after he has killed has authority to to cast into hell, right? So fear God. That's what he's talking about. So he's saying, don't feel, don't fear man, feel God. And not one of them, um, not one of them is forgotten before God. Why even the hairs of your head are all numbered? Fear not, you are of more values than the sparrows. Twice here we say, he says, don't be afraid of man, fear God. You're not forgotten, you're not forgotten, right? And it's just a, such a great, um, great moment there of Jesus of saying not to fear men because men will forget you. Men don't really care about you. They'll turn the back on you, but God will never forget you. He will always have you. Uh, we get to verse eight and it says, I tell you again, uh, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the son of man will also acknowledge um, before the angels of God. Where do we see the angels of God in Revelations? We see the angels of God in the throne room. They're, they're, they're there facing God, worshiping him. So what Jesus is saying there is he says, if, if you keep my name before men, I will keep your name before God in the throne room. If you don't keep my name before men, then I will not keep your name before God in the throne room, right? So um, that, that's, that's pretty significant, right? And then we get into uh, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And I know we talked about this on a Sunday morning. We talked about this out of Matthew. Um, but the one who blasphemies against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, right? Basically, right, what is the job of the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is always to testify to the person of Jesus Christ. That's what the Holy Spirit does, is always pointing to how great and how good and the job of Jesus Christ. And so when it says that person who... who um, blasphemies against the spirit. It's a person who testifies against Jesus. Now, this is not a magical word. This is not a magical magical formula of words. This is a person who has set their heart stone code against that of Jesus, right? And so when we talked about this, it's not that um, this sin is so large that Jesus can't forgive that. Absolutely not. Jesus forgives all sins. But it is a place that a person's heart is so cold and so bitter against God that he does not want to be saved and God will not save him, okay? Uh, and so we never know when that is, right? We, we never know 
Uh, you'll never run into a person and be like, that person has blasphemed against the Holy Spirit because you have no idea what's gonna happen tomorrow, right? So we never know. So no matter what, we always share the gospel, right? Uh, he gives a parable of the rich fool, someone in the crowd, uh, as Jesus is teaching about all of this, somebody kind of changes the subject and yells out to Jesus, hey, Jesus, um, tell my brother to divide his inheritance with me. Uh, in Jewish law, uh, the older brother gets two third, uh, and then all the other brothers would split the third. But there's apparently in this story, there's only two, right? Two thirds and a third. And so he's like, hey, tell him to go 50-50. Well, that's not Jewish law. That's not customary. But notice what happens. He said, but Jesus said to him, the man who made me a uh, man who made me a judge or arbitrator over you. And he said to them, take care and be on your guard. Notice this, against all covetousness. Jesus knew what the man's problem was. He knew that if he um, would have got more money, he, he had a problem of sin, of being covetous. And so we kind of have this idea. Jesus knew this, right? So Jesus says, hey, I'm not getting in the middle of this because if you had more money, it's gonna take you farther away. But he does tell him a parable. He told a parable and he said, there's a, um, a land of a rich man that produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, man, I don't have barns big enough. So what does he do? He tears down all of his barns. He builds bigger ones. And he says, uh, and he says to himself, man, you have laid up for many years. Relax, eat, and be merry. But as soon as he done all this, what happens? Verse 20, it says, God said to him, fool, idiot, dummy. Okay, that, that's truly what it means. Um, this night, your soul is required of you. There's an obligation there. God is saying, you're dead. You're, you're coming to me, right? And the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? This man has spent his whole life building barns and storing more grain and making more money and bigger tractors and all the things, right, of growing a farm. And he says, now that your life is over, who gets all that stuff? You, he didn't give that to God. He was giving that to Satan, right? He wasn't living his life for the kingdom of God. He was living it for the kingdom of himself. Anytime we leave for the, live for the kingdom of ourself, it is the kingdom of Satan. And so he says, who gets all this, right? So the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. And so he spent his life building up a kingdom uh, for Satan and not for God. Um, We've seen uh, in Matthew, right? What good is it to gain the world and forfeit your soul? That's, that's exactly what we're talking about here. And so Jesus goes right in um, to this idea of telling his disciples. He says, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious. For one, that's a command. Do not be anxious. Don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you put on your body or what you will put on it. These, these are physical things, right? Jesus is saying, don't worry about the physical things. He's coming off this idea of money and um, what does it take and storing the barn, right? And now he's coming in and he says, hey, don't worry about the physical things, right? Because when you worry about the physical things, you're like an animal. That's what animals do. They only worry about the physical things, but you are called by God. You don't live by physical things. You live by spiritual things. And we get some examples, right? We get the ravens. Hey, look at the ravens. They don't worry about anything, but God still feeds them. Look at the lilies. They don't worry about anything. God still feeds them. Look at the grass of the fields. They don't worry anything about God feeds them. How much more is God going to love you? How much more is God going to take care of you? He feeds the grass, the lilies, and the ravens. Surely he's going to keep and feed and protect and clothe uh, the children of God. Instead, verse 31, seek his kingdom and all these things will be added unto you. Stop seeking, seeking the physical needs, the things of this world, but seek ye the kingdom of God, right? And that's what he's talking about. Verse 32, he says, fear not little flock, which is a, it's a, a nice little endearment term, right? A, a small group of Christians um, not just a particular group, but he's saying overall, all Christians, the church, right? Um, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. That the Christians don't worry about the physical things, worry about God's kingdom, because what happens? God is going to give the kingdom of God, right? He's going to give what he has to the Christians, to those who believe. Don't worry about the little stuff, 
Sweat the big stuff. Sweat God, right? And have this idea of looking after him and focusing him after him and focusing after his kingdom. Because why? Because he's going to give us the kingdom. He's going to give us eternal life. He's going to give us all the things that he has promised. Uh, and then we just get some earthly ideas of what that looks like. Sell your possessions. Give to the needy. Um, provide yourself with money bags that don't grow old. Store up treasures in heaven. It's nothing about the physical. It's all about the spiritual, right? And we see in verse 34, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Your money always equals your heart, period. Period. It's biblical. You will always put your money where your heart is, whether that's a, a, a job, a hobby, golf, um, basketball, uh, hunting, um, crocheting, could be TV, could be media, could be anything. Your money will always be where your heart is. Wherever you put the most part of your money, that's where your heart will be. Uh, let's see, we get into verse 35, basically saying that we must be ready, stay awake, um, because God is coming back. Uh, and we kind of, we, we kind of dive in this idea of being ready, right? Being ready. The King is coming back. Um, and Peter said in verse 41, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for all of us, right? Are you telling just the disciples to be ready? Or are you telling everybody to be ready? And Jesus says, no, everybody needs to be ready, right? Everybody's got to have this. Um, he says in verse 45, but if the servant says to himself, my master is delayed in coming, he begins to beat the male, the female servants to eat and drink and get drunk. Now, this is really as, as those of you who are coming to our Wednesday night and we're walking through first John, this lines up really well with first John, because what happens, the people who are like us, but don't act like us, who always are against us, who are trying to break us up, right? They are against Christ. They are little a antichrist. And so here, that's what he's saying. He says, the servants um, who says the master is delayed in coming, the people, the followers of Jesus who are without expectation of Jesus coming, they don't believe Jesus is coming back, right? So they're just going to live their life however they want. Well, people who don't have expectation of Jesus coming back, what happens? They start to beat the male and the female servants. They start to hurt other servants of the king. They start to tear apart other Christians. They start to eat and drink. They're, they're dialing into world pleasures, right? They're, they're getting further away from the following the kingdom of God, but they're following the kingdom of the world. And then we even see they get drunk. They're intoxicated. Not only are they hurting the church, not only are they getting further away from the kingdom of God, but now they are living in sin, right? They're in a habitual act of being intoxicated, of living in sin. This is the whole thing that we see in First John, right? Those people who not were not of us are not with us, right? The people who have followed along Jesus, but they left, well, they really didn't have Jesus in their heart to begin with. They weren't really saved. They weren't of the church, right? And that's what he's talking about. In verse 47, it says, And the servant who knew his master's will, those who heard God's word, who heard the gospel, um, but did not get ready and act according to his will, they will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did what deserved the beating will reserve a light beating. Here we see punishment fits the crime. Okay? Those people who have been around church their whole life, they've heard the gospel, but they never accepted the gospel, it's going to be bad for them, right? Those who've never heard the gospel, they're still lost just as the other, but maybe they haven't heard the gospel. They're going to have a severe, have a less severe punishment. They're both going to hell, okay? They're both going, but there is a punishment there, and it's going to be less. The punishment matches the crime. And we kind of finish off this section with... Um, Jesus telling us that he did not come um, for peace, but he came for division, right? He says, I came to cast fire on the earth. That fire means Holy Spirit, the spread of the gospel, right? I came to catch the world on fire um, for the spirit of God. And with that, um, with that, we're, if we're already kindled, I have a baptism to be baptized with. 
That word baptism, right, it means what? It means to immerse, right? We're Baptists. We put somebody under. Well, what is Jesus? He's already been baptized. So when he says, I have a baptism to be baptized, what is this future baptism is about? What is the future immersion of Christ going to be? It's the immersion under the ground, right? He's going to die and then he will resurrect. And so when he says, I have a baptism to be baptized with and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. He is following the Father's will. He knows what it is. He knows it's going to be hard, but he's doing it. And now he's stressed until what? Until he completes the will of the Father, exactly what we should be doing every day. We should be stressed until we um, accomplish God's will for our life for that day. And that's exactly what he's doing. Um, and, and so he's going on and he says that I'm, I, I bring division, right? I didn't come to bring peace, but my gospel is so cutting and so dividing that mother and father are going to be against kids and kids are going to be against other kids and all these people because my word cuts and it's true. It's not just for everybody to get along. It, it is going to separate it because it is the truth. Um, and basically, we go back into this idea of interpreting time, um, telling us that um, Jesus fulfills the Old Testament prophecies. Verse 56, it says, you hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret this present time? He's basically saying, you guys, when you look at the sky, you know what the weather's going to be. You can look and kind of guess the future. And he says, here I am. I'm the Messiah. I feel all these Old Testament prophecies and you can't understand that I fulfill everything, that I am the future, right? You, you're not seeing this. Um, and then we finish with verse 57. It says, why do you not judge for yourself what is right? Um, as you go with your accuser before the magistrate, make an uh, uh, effort to settle, right? This idea of when you're going to the judge, as you're going to court, you're trying to get things right. You get pulled over for a speeding ticket. Do you go and argue to the judge or do you eventually just pay it just so you don't have to go because you're kind of afraid of going in front of the judge and him siding with the police officer and maybe giving you another ticket plus court fees plus, 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 right? So what do you do? You settle it and you pay before you go. It's exactly what Jesus is saying. He says, when you're going before the judge, what do you do? You settle you settle the crimes, right? And so he's saying all, all of you, all of these non-believers, they can see that the judge is getting close. And instead of settling and saying, man, I was wrong. Well, what do I need to do to correct this? They're doubling down and they're saying, I'm not wrong. I, there's no way. And they're not settling. And he ends with verse 59. I tell you that you will never get out until you have paid the very last penny. This is a very interesting a statement of Jesus telling us that there is a price to be paid in hell. There's a price to be paid in hell. It's not like jail that you can just work up and eventually you get enough money, you get out of hell. It's not how it works. There's a price to get out of hell. What is that price? It's perfection. It's to be the perfect sacrifice. When you're in hell, you're you're not perfect. You were a human. You sinned every single day. You chose to go against God. And so while you're in hell, you cannot pay the price of perfection to get into heaven, right? Only Jesus paid that price, right? Only Jesus, the perfect man, perfect God who died on the cross was the perfect substitute atonement. That's what he did, right? And so here, once you're in hell, Jesus is saying, it's too late. You, you can't pay the price to come into heaven. So you need to get everything right. You need to settle with the accuser. You need to believe in Jesus, settle the account so that when time ends, you won't go to hell, hell, but you will go to heaven. I know in Luke, these are long chapters uh, and they're kind of just sporadically all over the place as you read them. They're just little sections that don't make a lot of sense, but you guys are doing great. Uh, we're getting through this uh, and we will see you tomorrow on chapter 13. God bless.